So OpenAI launches ChatGPT Enterprise, the ChatGPT for big businesses. And the things they have here is pretty impressive. So we're launching ChatGPT Enterprise, which offers enterprise-grade security and privacy, unlimited higher-speed GPT-4 access, longer context windows, advanced data analysis capability. That's a really good one. We'll, more on that in a second. Customization options and much, much more. So since they launched this year, they've seen teams adopted in over 80% of Fortune 500 companies. It looks like they had early users for ChatGPT Enterprise. People are like Block, Canva, Carlyle, Estee Lauder, PwC, and Zapier. They're using ChatGPT to craft clear communications, accelerate coding tasks, rapidly explore answers to complex business questions, assist with creative work, and much, much more. So they're saying they're not going to train on your business data or conversations, and the models don't learn from you using it, from the businesses using it. But let's see what exactly this thing offers. So first of all, it's going to remove all usage gaps, and it performs up to two times faster. That's huge. We include a 32K context. So what that means is basically the context window, so how much data... ChatGPT can kind of process in, in one prompt, and that, that's, that's both what you're asking it and the information that you're giving it to it, as well as its answer and stuff like that. It has to fit in under a certain size. In this case, it's tokens. Tokens you can think of as kind of like one word equals to one token, but there's also a lot of words that can be two tokens. Characters can be one token, etc. But so this is going to allow users to process four times longer inputs or files. And ChatGPT Enterprise also provides unlimited access to advanced data analysis. What is advanced data analysis? Well, it's code interpreter. One thing that OpenAI is kind of bad at is naming things. They, they, they don't seem to get their names right ever. But code interpreter, as we all know it as, is extremely powerful. So having unlimited access to advanced this advanced data analysis through code interpreter, that just in and of itself is going to be massive. Like if they just sold that sort of module, just code interpreter by itself, I feel like every big company and every little business on earth would sign up if they could afford it. This feature enables both technical and non-technical teams to analyze information in seconds. Whether it's for financial researchers crunching market data, marketers analyzing survey results, or data scientists debugging an ETL script. And if you're looking to tailor ChatGPT to your organization, you can use our new shared chat templates to collaborate and build common workflows. So I think we're going to see this rolled out across many different businesses. This thing is way too powerful for other people to not use it. And at this time, there's nothing really that compares. Now we're seeing places like Meta slash Facebook, Google, et cetera, trying to catch up and, and they're making big leaps and strides. But as of right now, nothing quite matches GPT-4. There's nothing like Code Interpreter out there. Code Interpreter, I don't know why they called it Code Interpreter because that's not really what it does. So as an example of something you can do, Let's say you export a list of all of your transactions from all your customers, like all their purchases, right? Just get the raw data file, this huge massive thing with just like rows and columns of text and data and all sorts of crap. Now, if you wanted to start gaining insights from it, generally what you have to do is first of all, figure out kind of like what specifically you're looking for. And then you can start kind of like working through the data either with Excel or Tableau. You can use Python for a lot of this. But oftentimes in order to, let's say you wanted to you wanted to see what your lifetime customer value is for the different people on different plans that you have on whatever. So, if, so if somebody that, that signed up at 100 bucks a month, how much are they worth on average? How, what's their monthly recurring revenue for that sort of cohort, that group of people? Or let's say you wanted to see a chart of the growth over time. So something like that, it's not, it's not rocket science, but it would take some time. You would have to sit there and organize the information and either use Excel or you know write some sort of script that does that for you. Oftentimes, like Stripe, for example, you can pay extra to have those sort of advanced analytics. You pay a monthly fee to have access to those advanced analytics that show you kind of how your customers behave so that you can make better informed decisions. Or you can use Code Interpreter. You take that raw Excel file, you just throw it into Code Interpreter, and you just ask it questions. You say, for customers who signed up at $100 a month, what is my MRR, monthly recurring revenue? It's going to know what MRR stands for. And within seconds, I mean, it's going to be under a minute probably. I mean, it depends on the size of your file, but I tried this with some pretty chunky files and it's pretty fast. It's going to just tell you what that information is. If you want to make it into a chart, it will make you the chart. But the point is you take data and you just kind of throw it in there and then you just ask it questions in plain English. You can ask it to make charts and graphs, etc. I know somebody that's taking their MBA right now and one of the classes involves heavy use of Tableau. Tableau, for those who may not be aware, is kind of like Excel on steroids, or specifically it's Excel for more like visual data analysis. So you can take some like big data files, put it all in there, connect them, 
And you know what? It's it, it's time consuming. It's somewhat complicated. It's somewhat difficult, right? It's not rocket science, but it's also not something that you can quickly pick up in a few hours. You have to kind of spend some time, maybe take a few classes, maybe watch some YouTube videos, etc., to really get good with it. It's not very intuitive. It's not very easy. And the people that know how to use it and know how to manage data like this, that's a job in and of itself. So for example, in this little animation that's going on right here, so they're asking call center activity peaks. So kind of like, when are we getting the most calls per hour so that we can respond and put the right amount of fo phone agents online? And then data analysts would go and put together all the data, put together the file, create these little charts and stuff like that. Code interpreted just does it. You just ask it questions. If you don't like the colors, you just tell it to change the color. Everything's in English. You don't even really have to know what certain things are called. As long as you kind of can fumble out kind of what it is, what it does, ChatGPT, it'll figure it out. It'd be like, oh, you mean this? Sure, I can do that. Boom. So here's an example. It's basically what they're saying is this is instant data visualization. You throw the information in there and it pops out charts. And that's just one part of it. The rest is all the other things that you can do with OpenAI models, GPT-4, you know, if you need GPT-3.5, et cetera. So it's not just coding. It can effectively summarize meeting minutes, for example. And here, for example, is an open AI post called Creating an Automated Meeting Minutes Generator with Whisper and GPT-4, right? And it's basic, very simple Python code. You're using OpenAPI's Whisper model, which basically takes an audio file and transcribes it into text. Then GPT-4 comes in and generates a summary. It extracts key points, action items, and performs sentiment analysis, right? They have sort of a function call for each one of these. So for example, let's say you wanted to get the action items, right? It goes through and he's like, okay, Bob needs to do this. Julie needs to do that. And then the, that chat completion, it also has uh, a way for you to do a function call that's going to allow you to build in the ability to automatically create tasks in your task management software and assign it to the relevant person. Think about that for a second. Have you ever been in a meeting where, where people talked for like an hour or whatever, and you thought we reached some conclusion, some sort of who needs to do what, and then either that didn't happen or somebody thinks you're supposed to do it or whatever, this thing not only will just automatically keep track of everything, it'll summarize the meeting and it'll also assign tasks to everybody. It'll put them in their calendar, right? So if the boss goes, hey, Bob, do this. And Bob's like, okay, by the time Bob gets back to his desk, that thing is going to be on his calendar, on his to-do list or whatever project management software that you're using automatically. Like it's just done. It's just there. Nobody had to write it down. Nobody had to think about it. Nobody had to do, once this thing is installed, it just runs in the background and everybody's getting their little tasks handed out to them. So we're about to see this massive wave of this thing going through a lot of different corporations, people quickly moving to adjust to it all. But, but I think it's kind of important to also understand what this is going to cause. And it's important to understand that a lot of the jobs that are being done right now with people being paid, you know, 50,000 a year or more or less or whatever, a lot of them can be easily replaced with these basic function calls and Python code, and most importantly, all the tools that OpenAI has. Some time ago, we took a look at this Goldman Sachs report, the potentially large effects of artificial intelligence on economic growth. A couple of points from here. If generative AI delivers on its promised capabilities, the labor market could face significant disruption. Using data on occupational tasks in both the US and Europe, we find that roughly two thirds of current jobs are exposed to some degree of AI automation and that generative AI could also substitute up to one-fourth of current work. Extrapolating to our estimates globally suggests that generative AI could expose the equivalent of 30 million full-time jobs to automation. Now, I'm not taking a stance here. I'm not saying something's good or bad. I'm not going to play that game, but I think it is important to kind of have a clear understanding what the effects will be. Yes, we're going to have a huge boost in productivity. Companies are going to be a lot more profitable. They're going to be faster. The output is going to be much greater. Some of the things where this is really going to have a strong impact is things like office and administrative support. That's the number one, where almost half of the tasks that, that are done by people kind of in that, in that sector, in those job roles, they could be automated by AI. Then we have the legal profession. So a lot of the things that like the interns do, all the research and putting together all the documents and stuff like that, looking through a million files to find that one relevant passage, et cetera. A lot of that could be done by something like ChatGPT. Architecture and engineering is third. Now here we're seeing how well we can code with things like GPT-4. There's more and more things popping up where instead of starting, like if you wanted to build an application, instead of starting by coding it and writing code, you just kind of give a prompt and ChatGPT tries to, and it tries to start building out some of the code to get you started. Now, people, some people are really loving it and saying they can't possibly go back. They can't code without GPT-4 or something like that. Some people are saying it's not that good. It has bugs. But keep in mind that I think GPT-4 came out, what, like March? Like what, five, six months ago? 
And there's talks that GPT-5 is coming soon. So for arguing if it's the most amazing thing or not right now, can you imagine what the next wave is going to look like? Other things that are going to be impacted by this is business and financial operations, community and social service, management, sales and related, computer and mathematical, farming, fishing and forestry, etc. If you want to know who is safe, it's building and grounds, cleaning and maintenance. The next thing that we might see, and we've heard rumors about this for a while now, but something that's similar to Apple's App Store, but for OpenAI, where basically they're going to launch an App Store for apps that are using OpenAI's infrastructure and all their models to provide a certain service, and people will be able to just download and pay for it through OpenAI. What I personally would love to see is something between ChatGPT Enterprise and ChatGPT Pro, something like ChatGPT Advanced with some of these functionalities like listed here, but without necessarily needing to be a large enterprise. Now, at the beginning of the year, I said that I think OpenAI might be the first AI-only company, the first one to reach a trillion-dollar valuation, which would put it kind of in that big tech category with Apple and Amazon and Google, etc. At the time, that might have been a little bit crazy. So think about this. So the total wages in the United States, that's the total amount of money that all the businesses and everybody spends on wages, on paying people. And that's just the reported wages, right? So they're saying here 9.7 trillion. So let's say 10 trillion, because I'm sure at least a few people might have forgotten to report at least some of their wages, right? Can we, can we assume that? So 10 trillion and about a quarter of that, according to Goldman Sachs, can be fully automated by AI. So that's $2.5 trillion. That's your expense. If you're able to automate that and get rid of that expense, that drops down to your bottom line and your profit, your net profit just pops. And that's just from replacing wages. Because again, OpenAI, that's not all that they're doing. The whole point of GPT-4 is not just to automate some of the human labor. So things are accelerating. Things are getting exciting, but also a little bit scary. By the way, really fast, I got to give some credit to this guy. His name is Shamaf Palapatia. So he was born in Sri Lanka, fairly poor from, if I recall correctly. As a kid, they were able to get to Canada and then eventually into America. I think he was kind of like the man behind the curtain for Zuckerberg at Facebook. I think he was like the, the guy that was making a lot of that growth happen. And you might have seen him on the All In podcast. Oh, by the way, he's like a billionaire multiple times over. So I got to give him some credit because he tends to kind of see where a lot of the AI stuff is going. Some of his predictions about where certain things are going to go in this tech world, in this AI world, tend to be spot on, surprisingly spot on. Like his intuition for some of the stuff is better. By the way, a lot of people hate this guy because he's very, uh, he thinks very highly of himself. Let's put it that way. But I think it's deserved. I feel like if you can go from being born into some of the more poorest environments in the world and then become a multi-multi-billionaire, I mean, you're, you're not stupid, right? But one thing he cautioned people is to avoid building these like GPT, GPT wrappers. So basically he said, avoid just building apps where you just take GPT-4 and then you kind of put a little wrapper on it. So it's like a little app, right? Like it generates quotes or something, right? And then you, you make that into a quote maker. So he said, don't just build the entire thing on top of the open AI architecture. Because he said at some point, and I, I'm not quoting him exactly, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines, at some point, OpenAI might want to go into that arena and they're just going to pull the rug from underneath you. And the example he gave is when thing, I think Zynga or whoever owned Farmville when they were building out Farmville on Facebook, right? It was kind of assumed that they were able to build on Facebook and do all that stuff on there. And Facebook is going to, it will just allow them to build on top of the sort of the Facebook base layer. And then, and eventually Facebook just changed their mind. It no longer suited their needs. They didn't want all their users sitting on Farmville. They wanted them engaging and sharing photos or whatever. So they just pulled the rug on Farmville. What's interesting is I wonder if Shamaf was the one that kind of orchestrated that whole thing, because that's what he was kind of doing at the time. But that's another thing that I'm seeing. We've had many startups and businesses already killed because they existed as simply as a open AI wrapper. One of them was initially, I think it was called Jarvis, and then they had to change the name to Jasper. It used to be this SEO tool where it would just generate articles for you. It came out before ChatGPT, before people knew about this, and it, was, it seemed revolutionary at the time. I don't know how they're doing now, but they have to be struggling because now, you know, GPT-4 is just a million times better on, on all levels than anything that they could provide. They have, they have no moat, and they're almost competing with OpenAI at this point. You know the expression, ask and you shall receive? I actually did not know this, but this is CNBC. They posted, a, they posted an article, interestingly, seven minutes after OpenAI announced Chad GPT Enterprise, but the company also plans to introduce another tier of usage called Chat GPT Business for smaller teams, but did not specify a timeline. 
this is kind of what I'm more interested in, ChatGPT business. So it's for smaller teams, for small businesses, not the enterprise level, but it's better than ChatGPT Pro. Kind of looking forward to that. But remember all those articles talking about how OpenAI is going to go bankrupt? I think they popped up like a few weeks ago. I personally think OpenAI is going to be the fastest company to go from zero to one trillion in the history of the world. And we're about to witness it live. If you enjoy AI news and want some in-depth deep dives into AI articles and scientific papers, hit that subscribe button. Make it so, number one.